we begin? How's that? So let's try again with me waxing lyrical about how wonderful Bristol is. It's a wonderful place, isn't it? You lucky people. I spent six glorious years here back in the 80s and uh, in, the, in lost days, and it was uh, it's always a joy to come back here. So uh, this morning, uh, I want to spend some time talking to you about perhaps a somewhat different view of heterogeneous processing, where this is headed, uh, and some of the factors influencing it. I'm going to have a look at what's actually driving heterogeneous platforms from a volume perspective, uh, and how that impacts uh, uh, things. I think we've got two worlds here almost. You've got the HPC world, and you've got the high volume consumer world. And this is a very exciting decade ahead of us because they're coming together. Uh, and it's on this sort of stuff that they're going to converge. So we're here for a very, very exciting decade ahead of us in heterogeneous. So what, we, what I think heterogeneous processes are uh, and what it means for both the hardware platforms, the systems on chip, the SOCs, as well as for the applications and the portability of applications, something that several speakers have referred to this morning. Uh, a few related trends along the way and then some conclusions and I will do my very best to uh, leave a bit of time for some questions. And uh, so it was very interesting listening to David's talk earlier on this morning. I was getting very worried because I agreed with quite a lot of what he said, but I was delighted to see that as it got further on, I agreed with less and less of it. So that's, uh, look forward to uh, discussion later on today. So what does imagination do? We're an IP company. I mean, just remember, guys, the UK is at the heart of the intellectual property industry driving the world. I will come back to that because we are in a very, very special place here right now. Um, and so what imagination does is we regard ourselves as a heterogeneous processor IP company. By that we mean we design a series of different processes, each of which is specialized for doing a particular domain uh, of processing. So we're best known for our Power VR graphics processes where we're uh, universally recognized as number one in that in mobile and embedded. Um, our, uh, we also have very strong video processing and, and now vision processing with cameras. Uh, and indeed our H.265 engines are just uh, coming out uh, very, very shortly, which is uh, getting very exciting for us. So I was very interested by the bandwidth question earlier. I wanted to leap in on that, but that's for later. Uh, we've got our Insigma RPU, which actually is based uh, mainly out of Chepstow, just down the road from here, uh, which is our communications or radio processor, uh, doing all forms of connectivity, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, TV, radio, which made it name in DAB here. Um, and for those of you that haven't been reading, uh, as of earlier this year, we are now the proud owner of MIPS processors. So you now have two British-owned processor architectures of the three that are, t that are dominating the world. Uh, so we are indeed in interesting times, and we intend to make it a lot more interesting in the years ahead. But that's what we see as a heterogeneous platform, and I'll come back to this a few more times later on. But it doesn't stop at the device. It also goes out to the internet, talking to other devices, and so the connectivity of processes cannot be ignored. No point in having gazillions of flops here if you find you're strangled by you know, a megabit going to the cloud. And the, and the application relies on that. So you've got to take everything into perspective, and these solutions are what matter. And unified memory is what's driving our volume devices, and that's why this issue of bandwidth and memories technologies is all very important too. So anyway, that's our view of the world. Each of them stands on its own, but join them together, and they do great things. That's how we see the future of heterogeneous processing. So what's so important for us? Well, historically, so much of processor technology has been driven by the high performance end of the world, and, and I think a lot of us have been involved in that in various stages in our careers. But what's happening now is high performance computing is moving into high volume, because that's where the money is. And the money to churn a new SOC is getting higher and higher. We're talking 50 to $100 million to get a state-of-the-art SOC out. More when you're going into the more advanced processes. You simply can't design that many of these things, so they better be good. And once we've designed them, uh, the gap between what a piece of silicon can do and what an application uses of it is an eternal frustration that has certainly dogged me for my entire career, and I suspect lots of you too. And that's our job. How do we get the most performance out of these advanced SOCs? But the volume which is enabling these platforms to now be accessible to everybody in this room is consumers. Consumers are driving the volume, 
And products are only successful as consumers buy them. And the thing is, they are. They're buying them in the billions. And yes, I know David's worried about where they're sitting in the cupboards. Actually, they're doing great things in the third world, but that's for another day. Um, but users are going to use this stuff because it makes their lives better, it makes them happier, it makes them healthier, and power consumption saves the planet, so you're doing your bit. The point is they're useful. And of the people I know that use smartphones these days, I find quite a lot of them, like all of them, find it useful. It helps your life. Now, you can raise your stress levels too, um, as per my call at 10.30 last night from our CEO. But they are very, very useful. So that is what is powering the availability of heterogeneous processes. Expectations are changing. Consumers are demanding. They're technology aware. They don't understand how any of this stuff works, but they know now what they can do with this. And that's the exciting thing. It's what we do with heterogeneous applications running on heterogeneous uh, processes, and I'm going to talk a bit more about that later on. And the fact that this one size fit all, whether it's hardware, software, or consumers, doesn't work. Unfortunately, or fortunately for us, we live in a diverse world, but if they're a connected one, there's a lot of different people that have a lot of different views on how they want to run their lives. So you need applications that run on these platforms, but they need to always work, and they always need to use the processing resources available on that. To me, that's the big challenge of heterogeneous processing, multi-core processing, um, of using the resources that you've got available to you. So, if we look at this, accelerators have come a long way. Drives me crazy, this. But for many, many years, people have been conditioned to be very CPU-centric. And everything is a peripheral to the CPU. The CPU manages everything. The CPU demands the memory. And so you've got peripherals from simple GPIO through to communications chips. And so when we start bringing graphics in, it's treated as a peripheral. And indeed, for, for many reasons, that worked quite successfully for quite a few years. Same with video decode and encode. But they have matured because of the sophistication. Indeed, now the processing power here is dwarfing the processing power there. And that's what's changing. So they are no longer peripherals. Please get rid of that idea of peripherals, accelerators. These are not. These are processors that cooperate. And this is one class of processor these are other classes of processor, and we have more classes of processor over there. And they're going to continue to grow. And so the idea of an accelerator is very high, but it's now offloading from one process to another, of optim optimizing the execution. So heterogeneous processes of the future, we could, that's why we use this terminology of a GPU, a, a VPU, an RPU, R, RPU, because we are, CPU is already gone. Otherwise, we call it a comms processor, of course. And it's how you optimize each of these that really matters. And these are our different processes. Within imagination, we have four, at least four different types of engines. We've got three different data paths going here from our general purpose data path and the MIPS CPUs through to the shader engine within a, power, uh, within a GPU. In the video processor, actually, the, the programmability is just a very small microcontrol at the front end doing, uh, doing header processing and stream processing and configuring the hardware. It's still programmable, but just at a different level. The radio processor is different again, where you've got programmable control. We've actually got two processors here, a 32-bit processor doing control, a VLIW engine doing complex vector processing on modulation. Uh, and then, the, and this is the big difference, is surrounded by a mixture of configurable and fixed hardware. This in our opinion, it's how you get low power, and low power is what dominates everything we do, low power and integration on chip. And this is why, in looking at a processor, you've got to look at what you're talking about here. It's not just the data path that's executing. It's not just data path to memory. It's how you move data in and out of the system, and whether a programmable element is power efficient. In the case, for example, of video, which is not that one, it's that one, you, most of this is configurable hardware because it's a well-defined problem. High throughput, extremely high bandwidths, but very well defined. So we use primarily a series of configurable engines supervised by a program below them. So it's an example of different processes doing different things. So I'm sure, David, you and I can have an interesting discussion about that later on. <laughs> Not just I.O. Anyway, <laughs> but, I, but let's uh, move on. <laughs>
So the point is each processor is good at doing its own thing. And the big question now in moving the whole paradigm on is what is the CPU doing? And historically, we've spent so much time trying to optimize on the CPU because the relationship between the CPU and these other processes was so poor, so weak, so ill-defined um, that there was no portability. And so it was usually much more practical to do that on the CPU. That is now changing. And we'll go through a bit more of that in a moment. So increasing this, CPU should be seen as a control element, controlling these other processor engines and how we do that. That's the way you write applications. And that's how you get portability. So an example of innovation in processes is we're well known for GPUs. Now, a GPU uh, is, is primarily an array of, of uh, 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 data paths that are executing shaders in parallel. Um, as David quite rightly pointed out this morning, it's a MIMD machine. It's not SIMD. Uh, so they're all executing at their natural rates. Um, when going to ray tracing, this is a holy grail of graphics. The graphics over here, this is a game called Real Racing uh, 3, state-of-the-art in terms of graphics in current generation. But what you find is over half of the production costs of making that game are in artwork, creating textures that are pre-baked to fake light. Because the way that graphics has become cost-effective, certainly for gaming and a lot of the stuff you see today, is by faking an awful lot, which means it's very, very constrained. And actually, you, whenever you see high-quality uh, you'll be using ray tracing. That's any CGI type stuff, any films that you see, uh, any ads that you see, most cars that you see in ads and anything other than the metal, they're all ray traced because that's the way light is modeled perfectly. Now, we've got a new processor coming out which brings this uh, to uh, mobile. And we're doing that over the next three to five years, and that's moving very, very rapidly. Um, the key thing is this is an extension to the processing. It's fully programmable. It uses a new a API called OpenRL, and we've also got a higher level API called Brazil for rendering. Um, but, the, but the key thing that we've broken the back of is bandwidth management, how we manage bandwidth, how we search for rays, and that is all in configurable hardware, complemented by the shader engines in our graphics. So it's an example of how by thinking more heterogeneously, we can actually bring a new level of performance to an existing system without breaking the back of everybody having to recode everything. You can migrate existing applications in this way. So you'll see a lot more from this from us in the next year or so. You can buy an early version of this today, by the way. We've got a PC card uh, from our caustic division that uh, is shipping now. So what does this mean for hardware platforms? Well. One of the things is reality, and this is, I think, the difference between the HPC world and the mobile world. The mobile world is a smartphone driven by the silicon, and it's actually driven by the apps. The user experience is driven by the apps that you use to get the job done that you want done. And that user experience has to be smooth. It has to be fast, and so on. And the upgrades are usually bringing new capabilities uh, and therefore, they need to get to market very quickly as well. And we're actually learning some lessons here from, from our Asian colleagues. If you, for those of you who know, the path from getting IP through to designing the chip to getting the chip designed into the phone to getting that phone actually deployed or the tablet, it's typically several years. And so if you start that whole process sequentially for the next generation, basically you'll be out of business before the time you get the next one out. You can't work that way. So there's all sorts of things whereby we get the upgrade process moving faster. And sometimes the upgrade is for performance. Sometimes it's for cost. Sometimes it is for particular features. Um, there are a lot of different things that force that. But we have to get a lot, lot faster in how we do things, which means you can't afford to rebuild an application each time you do one of these upgrades. They have to be more portable. So things like getting, developing a new PCB each time, um, some of our Chinese colleagues are very good at doing designs where several generations use basically the same pinout. It gets them to the first stage of early deployment. That gets the revenue moving, the early upgrade, and it's all about time to volume for those guys. We're learning some very interesting lessons from that. Software base ports must be quick. Um, yeah, this has historically been hugely painful, bringing up all of the basics from getting a basic bootloader to getting all the I.O. work and stuff. You've just got to get better at it because we're now putting all these other processes, and we have to, uh, to again, get portability in the baseline OS builds. 
Um, choice of memory is going to be critical in all of this, and, uh, and I'll touch a bit on that later on. Lower uh, for lower performance, though, is driving volume just as much as high performance. And there, power is often a key criteria for that. Not necessarily continuing to reduce power, but doing a lot more for the same very restricted power budget. And as one of the speakers mentioned earlier on, um, the design, particularly in phones, is, is driven by the thermal envelope. It's not even the power envelope, it's the thermal envelope. Um, to make sure that when you're running this thing, um, you're not down to A&E because your hand's burnt. So, and believe you me, some of the recent product shipping have experienced things that are dangerously close to that. So power, cost, as well as performance, all of these are driving the technology. Um, and so the application and the peripherals like comms compatibility, these are all important. And as has been discussed today, this is actually a very, very key area. The whole bus fabric, the SOC infrastructure built using that, how you join these processes together, how they communicate with memory, how they talk to all the peripherals in the system. Attention to detail in this, from what we've seen over hundreds of SOCs, makes a huge difference. I've seen factors of at least four to five X using the same processors, the same CPU, the same GPU, and just because they did a different, so we say a different job on implementing the, the SOC, you'll see a performance at least four or five X difference. Um, getting balance, which is another word I've heard this morning, is utterly key in making these things work. And one of the initiatives, uh, which I know people like uh, Bristol are involved in, is uh, HSA, the Heterogeneous System Architecture Foundation. That's about standardizing um, uh, the, the link between processes. It's driven by CPU and GPU. Uh, it's obviously moving, in our opinion, beyond that, but those are the two highest performance ones today. And being able to link these in a, in a way so an application can actually have some awareness. This, this is no longer just a simple bunch of wires here. There's a lot of intelligence in the infrastructure itself. Indeed, it's another process that you can regard as. And so therefore, how you manage that as part of your environment in an open standards way, we believe is very important for the industry, which is why we're a founder in it. And it's delightful to see that uh, Bristol is one of the earliest academic partners in HSA. So the key thing is the execution platforms will vary massively, but they're all going to look variants on a theme. Um, when I came up with this, this drawing, I've used this for a number of presentations now because this is how we see life. Everything is going to have uh, a CPU controlling it. You're going to have communications at the front end. You're going to have multimedia at the back end. With embedded applications, increasingly, the multimedia may not be driving a screen. So it may be do, whether it's doing video transcoding or it's using GPU compute and so on. But uh, whatever, there's mixes of these different processing elements. Uh, in, in, the, in the way. So uh, you may see here, this is a, a mix where the areas are broadly representative of what may be on a mobile phone chip, but we're now finding the GPU exceeds the CPU in area, um, simply because you can get so much more performance out of the graphics. If you uh, go to another application where you may find, for example, it's a networking where transcoding is the big thing, and it's all about video throughput and so on, you may beef up your VPU, the CPU is probably the same, but shrink the CPU because it's less effective in that way. In other applications, you may decide it's all about comms, and so the radio processor dominates, uh, and the processor for doing the higher level protocol processing, and, and the multimedia is relegated to, to a small part or nothing at all. They're all different, but they're all variations on a common theme. And where we see, certainly for any, val for any volume, um, you have a unified memory. And I was very interested by the earlier point about cache coherency, which is certainly one of the things in HSA, and I think that's an argument that will rage for a long time. I believe at the high end there is value. I, I personally am in two minds as to how much cache coherency is the right way to go. Um, but also remember, distributed through here is a hierarchy of many levels of localized memories, from level one, level two, level three caches. Uh, in, our G, in our GPUs, we've got tile processes that have their own store and register files. There's a huge complexity in the memory architecture. It isn't simply a case of having a data path in memory. That whole memory hierarchy is very, very important. And this is how you manage bandwidth, because this bandwidth is clearly throttled, um, but the bandwidth you've got on chip, you've, that's why this hierarchy, doing this right, makes such a difference to your system. And so just a, a couple of example trends is that in GPU performance, this is the scaling from uh, our high end, what we're seeing at the moment, 
Uh, the chips that are just starting to ship now, to give you an idea, in phones are of the order of 100 gigaflops of GPU capacity at high end. Today, mobile, sub one watt on the GPU. That's where we are today. The low end, they're probably an order of magnitude lower because of cost and various other constraints. So if you follow a simple trend of a doubling per year, which we think is conservative, um, but if you look at the doubling of trend, it's not just the fact that this performance is very rapidly heading to a teraflop, which it is in a mobile device. We'll have that fairly shortly. But it's the envelope. And this comes back to the theme of application portability. An application targeting a particular performance point is going to be very limited indeed, whether it's targeting a low end or a high end. That is going to be a very, very bad assumption. So what we're finding already is applications that understand this in the mobile space that can adapt what they're doing, depending on whether they've got you know, a 20 gigaflop or a 200 gigaflop GPU, are the more successful applications. Now, applications are driving this volume. They need to address the widest possible market. However much ideology you get, when it comes to the application world, they're driven by volume. How many can they sell? And the more we get application portability, the more developers will target these platforms and the whole world moves on. So this envelope and the breadth of it, because of the parallel processing inherent in the GPU in this case, is fundamental to what's changing the dynamics in this industry. And as we discussed earlier, the, the, the thing is a sequential processor is fundamentally capping in terms of what you can do. And you're getting increasingly these, these dramatic levels of complexity for at times quite dubious benefits in sequential. That's not because a sequential processor is a bad thing. It's just it's done its dash. And you should be using processors, different processes, to do different jobs right. So in processing power, that's moving hugely. And that's the rate per year you can see as a, as a fairly conservative estimate of what's going to be happening here. So when you look at that envelope widening, this is going to drive application portability even more. The other thing, as been mentioned several times, is, is bandwidth. And this ties into silicon processing, what memory you've got on chip. And as you keep increasing the silicon nodes, uh, and leakage becomes more and more dominant. So one of the things we're looking at is also how much memory you put on chip and how you design. And every generation of silicon node, that equation really, really changes as to what you keep on chip and what not. And this is how you manage bandwidth. This is complemented by things like wide I.O. memory. This is a must-have. It's all about fattening up the bus and being able to get it extremely close. So stacked uh, 3D ICs is something we're putting a lot of investment in with partners like TSMC and Global and the memory manufacturers. As we see the trend over the next couple of years, moving fairly rapidly to, to 50 gigabyte per second with mobile mainly memory. This isn't GDDR5. This is mobile mainstream memory. So the bandwidth is going up, but still, it's never going to be enough. And things like ray tracing and some of the other GPU compute is always going to push the limits of bandwidth. This is why we are now working with people like TSMC on, six, on driving their 16 FinTech program, because the biggest pressure point on all of the key parameters of process is now the GPU. It pushes power, it pushes uh, synchronous power demands, and it pushes bandwidth. So therefore, it's now the new process driver for this generation. So what does it mean for apps? And this, in just as the same as you've got the high performance world and the commodity uh, mobile world, so we have the hardware engineer and the software engineer. My god, I wish they'd talk to each other a bit more often. Drives me crazy. We talk about new languages. One of some of the best parallel programmers are hardware engineers, been doing it all their lives. So, if only we could get them to communicate. But life is like that. And when you're in a volume market, the lowest common denominator is a frighteningly low level. But we've got, in developing this, we're going to exploit this whole heterogeneous trend and the sheer breadth of these, these products. And let's just get this in perspective. We're talking about smartphones using these heterogeneous platforms, shipping at a billion units a year this year. So you've got a huge chargeable market and a huge opportunity in the application space to exploit something that is, on the whole, being very poorly utilized. So one of the basic things is portability does not mean loss of performance. Historically, 
it always has meant that. And we've all gone through the various traumas of Java and all sorts of joys of, of, of abstracting, because it usually just drives to the lowest common denominator. But now with the way technologies are going, that doesn't have to be the case. But that means an application now has to bring in a discovery phase to how it executes. It needs to identify what resources are available to it in terms of memory, what processes, what communications. They need to understand the performance, which is not necessarily all the chip. One of the things that historically kills um, uh, or, or lowers expectations, shall we say, in the mobile space is benchmarks go running off and saying, this chip can run that. And it's fine as long as you're, you don't want your phone to actually work. Yeah? Unfortunately, on real products, they do need to work. So therefore, what resources do you actually have available to you? And it's not going to be static either. So therefore, being able to be continuously aware of what resources and your ability to adapt to what the user wants to do with them while using this processing power. These are all things an application now needs to be much more aware of. So this discovery phase from the number of processes to the performance capability, what else is going in the system, what information do I get about the dynamics of the user changing, uh, and so on, and how I relate the capabilities I discover to what I'm actually doing. This is where we need the work going on. This is the work in heterogeneous processing uh, that we need to have happening between academia and industry and OEMs and all of us working together. So this discovery phase has to change from maximizing performance, not dumbing down to the lowest common denominator, which in my experience is how it historically has always been. So this portability is all about abstraction. We can have another jolly good dialogue about what the term abstraction means. Um, the fundamental is applications need to run on any platform. And abstracting, uh, I, I agree with David, is about maximizing the use of performance, not hiding it away necessarily, and navigating that level of abstraction is critical. If you want to hit a vast rump of, you, of developers, they're going, to do, they're going to take the simplest way out. That's, that's a fact of life. So your abstraction needs to, by and large, hide complexity and deliver as much as you can. But then there's a whole raft of users, which are the ones that will differentiate, where they do want more access, but in a structured way and still in a portable way. So abstraction has to work at multiple levels. Simple example, gaming. How many, uh, the, the API choice in, in graphics in mobile is OpenGL ES2, just moving to OpenGL ES3 now. How many game developers write their applications in native OpenGL ES3 APIs? I'd say perhaps 10%, if that. A lot of them use game engines, which have just raised the level of abstraction to do all of the hard stuff so they can focus on the high-level game activity. This is an example, and the level of abstraction and the layers of abstraction are going to keep moving. That's what's going to drive our industry going forward. It's not just GPUs, though. So we've got CPUs are a big issue because the CPU has stubbornly stuck to binaries being unportable. They're stuck to a specific ISA. That has got to change. It will change. We've got three mainstream CPUs in the Android world, uh, which is x86, ARM, and MIPS. And that will continue for a long time to come. But now to use these, the applications have to be able to traverse any CPU in just the same way as they do any GPU. And indeed, as they use different comms. We've done this with everything else. We've got to do it in the CPU itself. And so how we do it? Well, there's a number of ways. So there's, one of them is abstracting away using uh, high-performance compute uh, uh, APIs, OpenCL, RenderScript, FilterScript. Are ways of doing it, a surprising amount done in graphics land using OpenGL and OpenGL ES. It's a shader language. It's a, just another form of compute when you think about it. Then we're quite excited by the potential for LLVM bit code based portable binaries um, because the more the compiler world is moving to LLVM based platforms, the more that opportunity offers the, the potential for a universal portable binary format. Um, that's another direction. There's high-level runtimes, and, and I, you know, I could see, I, I would make a bet the majority in the room would cringe when they see the word Java up there, but it's coming back to now understanding how to use it. And in the Android environment, think of it as a supervisory, a launcher, not something where you try and get performance out of it. And when used in that way, we're getting tremendous application portability at high level, of, of high-performance applications. And then we get to things like binary translation, which are actually very, very mature. Uh, for example, in, in, on Android, we've now got approaching 95% compatibility on running other binary formats on this processor. So we can move things around. But it, it's not the right way to do it. 
but these, these solutions, there are more and more solutions around. But we have to break this dependency of CPU ISA just the same way as we've done it for every other processor. And this is part of the future of heterogeneous processing. So because these platforms are going to vary hugely, um, what an application is now going to do is it's going to start, let's see if this works, doing that. It's going to start with this new phase. And this, to me, this discovery phase, it's taking a look at everything in there and seeing what it's got. That is going to be a huge and fertile area for research, for innovation in the application world. How an application can adapt and scale across orders of magnitude of processing performance at any particular point in time. And having done that, it will then use the abstraction to be able to load itself into the various processing resources, whether it's loading into the CPU or it's loading in, uh, talking to the graphics. Uh, when it's talking to the video, it's, it's a combination of APIs and codec formats clearly here. Uh, in the comms, we'll both talk to comms and think we're, we're besotted by CPUs and now GPUs for GPU compute. Now, this is a complex VLIW processor, completely programmable. Why shouldn't you use that for a class of processing as well? And therefore, how do these abstractions work on other processes you have in your system? Just the same as we're doing with GPU compute. So this is, to me, the future of applications, a discovery phase, followed by this abstraction. And these APIs, over the next five to 10 years, need to go up a level. And historically, we're very good at stalling at this point, because as soon as you abstract, you start getting more domain specific and you polarize. That may be fine. But this is the future, a set of abstracted APIs which together completely abstract the platform so then everybody can compete on doing the best, best job in various domains. So it means applications will now discover, optimize, and scale themselves and fundamentally adapt themselves at start time, at load time. So just to bring it to an end, platforms and apps must change and they are changing. That is unstoppable. That means there's huge opportunities for all of us to be able to exploit what I think is the most exciting uh, decade I've seen for, for compute platforms. Uh, apps are becoming hugely scalable, and the opportunities to do this here in the UK are really quite immense. Just look at the capabilities we have in this country. But be realistic. So, uh, you know, in terms of silicon, silicon progress is far from over. We're going to continue progress. So there's innovation in silicon. But each SOC is incredibly expensive to build. The re upgrade rate is speeding up. So we have to break this, but that means there's an opportunity. We're very good at this in the UK, of being able to take a holistic view and solve this. The breadth of SOCs is broadening. As I said, the showcase right now is smartphones. Tomorrow, the Internet of Things, connected everything is going to be hugely exciting, and we have a very, very major play in that. The skills we've got in here from compilers, heterogeneous tool chains, through to all the process structures, they're all being developed here in the UK. And Saeed insisted that I could only get up here if I told you we're hiring. <laughs> Compilers, architecture, RTL, digital design, all of these, including in our Bristol Center. Uh, but also in Sunnyvale and Kings Lang and really wherever you want to be, really. Um, there you go, plug them. Uh, uh, we need to also, as the UK, be more active in the API and standards development. I think the UK is very good at being very democratic. We have to be just a little bit more aggressive. Not, not arrogant, but we need to be more involved. And that's for all of us as a community. But we are, UK guys, we are the world leader in processor architectures. And so we need to move from being world leaders in this to leading the world in heterogeneous platforms and heterogeneous application technologies. And I think we've got all the tools to do just that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, one of the things from the, 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 uh, what you said is that you have systems that give a, an easy inroad for hackers. What's the security implications and how do you manage it? God, how long have we got? Uh, you're absolutely right, Stephen. It's a massive question. Security in each of the processes is a big issue. And certainly we see the, architect the security architectures are fundamental to this. And... Uh, Obviously, a lot of work's happened in the CPU space. We're looking at it, obviously, in the GPU space and others as well. Um, security architectures is going to be an ever more dominant thing. And, and making an application so it will navigate security without getting the eternal, you are not authorized for this, is going to be a big issue for this. But, so you're right, security is a big issue. 
Uh, it's, there's a variety of tools at our disposal. A number of them have to be down in hardware. It can't all be done in software. And what you find, and I found this from, from days working on smart cards, is the, the hierarchy of security. It's one thing to be secure so your, so your app is not ripped off. It's quite another when you're selling a Hollywood you know, uh, latest release where the, the, the paranoia of protecting that is absolutely extreme. And there, to, to get that ratified and agreed to those people is a whole new world. These mobile platforms are solving that now because they absolutely must. And so it's a mixture of hardware and software and another area to innovate. But as you've got code being loaded in multiple processes, yes, it, there's, a, there's a lot to do there. Okay. Time for another question, for those of me. I was right at the back. I'll give it on. It's Nick. You want to make the halfway, Nick? <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> Thank you, Tony. I was just curious on your, um, after your discovery phase, where you actually see the, um, all this code actually being acquired from, because our traditional view of the app is a block of software that is delivered in one go. You seem to be implying that that's no longer the case, that your discovery, maybe a Java engine, then goes away, finds in the cloud, the elements of code that you need, and you're putting everything together in a real-time assembly kind of approach. And that's a very, very different model to the one that we use today. Yeah, good question. Uh, it's, um, it's one way in which an application can discover and configure itself, but it's certainly not the only way. So my vision actually for that is actually it's reconfiguring the code which is already there. So a classic example of that is in a game where it will start up, it will decide what level of GPU it's got, and it will adjust what textures it uses, what resolution of models that it's kicking in, in order to run the game itself. Now, that's all within the application. It's all within the data it's already got. And I think this raises from the user experience the, well, just go out to the cloud and get everything. Well, I don't know about you, but keeping a phone call going from Reading to Bristol this morning was not the easiest thing. And therefore, the reality from the user experience of point of view is local processing and, and local data is absolutely key because users now, if they don't get the right experience in the first couple of minutes, as far as they're concerned, it's junk. And now in the tech, this era of technology, they're right. So I see a lot of it as being having a load where you do a one-time load and once it's started, yes, it can sort itself out with what the resources it's already got. It's not about bringing in massive new chunks of code. That isn't to say applications can't do that. I mean, they're doing that today, whether they're detecting updates to themselves or going and getting new scenes or so on. Um, and this is just another aspect of being driven by the user experience. But that's why I put the consumer foil up front, is you've got to think in terms of what the user experience is. Uh, and that is no longer, that shouldn't be a dirty word. It's if you design things right, so the user experience is always great, you will get a, a superior thing. So application discovery must take those realities into account, but it doesn't mean drag everything from there. Absolutely not. It can all be embedded. And this isn't just for high-end things like apps. It can be low-end, deeply embedded applications where it's just configuring. We all, and in reality, all these apps are doing it today. It's just getting more structure and definition. Comms is dynamically adapting to the error rate you're getting at a particular point in time or what bandwidth you're seeing or packet loss or whatever. It's all happening. It's just these are the sorts of things we've got to clean up from a standards point of view and from an abstraction perspective. Okay. Okay. Brilliant. Thank you, Tony. Thank you.